one second, chat. I have to. Oh no, I don't know if I. Hold on, chat. Hold on. <laughs> chat let's get started welcome to another healthy gamer gg stream my name is Olo kanoja just a reminder that everything we discuss on stream is intended to be taken uh as education or entertainment and nothing is intended to be taken as medical advice if y'all have a concern or question please go see a licensed professional um, so today we are talking with Dr. Uma Naidu, who is a psychiatrist who specializes in the effect of food and mood. Um, so we're going to be hopping in with her and we'll do like kind of a full introduction, but hopefully this is very, very helpful for y'all. Echo. Echo. Oh, how's that? Fixed? Saved? 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 Chat? Saved? Okay. Um. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So, we'll be talking with Dr. Naidu, um, and we're going to be talking about, like, food and mood. So, we're going to have a conversation about anxiety and, like, the effect of food and things like that. So, we've got, like, a real expert, okay? This isn't, like, a Dr. K-flavored expert. This is, like, a real expert. And then on Monday, we're going to be talking with Dan Clancy, okay? CEO of Twitch. So let's hop in, but let me see if I can figure this out. So hello, Dr. Naidu. Okay, this is the wrong thing. One second. I'm going to fix something real quick because this says Sneeko, and you are certainly not Sneeko. Um, okay, that's fixed. Hold on. For some reason, it didn't save some of my settings. And then the next thing that we're going to do is this we're going to do this there we go all right oh you're little... okay perfect okay so um let's just make sure to ca count to 10 for me again one two Beautiful. three so uh welcome dr naidu to our little corner of the internet um, so can you tell us a little bit about what you, uh, first of all, should we call you Dr. Naidu? What do you, what do you go by? Um, on, on social media, it goes Dr. Uma, but you okay. can call me Uma, whatever works. Uh, Thanks, Dr. Uma Thanks works for having great. me. And um, can you tell us just a little bit about what your area of expertise is and, and where you exist in your day job? Um, so I'll start with my area of niche expertise, which is the combination of nutrition for mental well-being. It's a field that is new and emerging called nutritional and metabolic psychiatry. And I come to that with uh, diversity of training. I'm a Harvard-trained psychiatrist. I'm also a trained professional chef and author of a couple of books um, and a trained nutritional biologist and what that does, Alok, is it brings my um, expertise together to help people choose the best foods for their mental well-being. And it, I think it's something that is overlooked. Um, often prescriptions are the first thing given to people instead of a discussion of lifestyle. And nutrition is a pillar of lifestyle changes that we can make. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about, like, you know, how does food intersect with mood or mental health? So I'd like to give a, what seems like a really simple example, but it'll help to break down the a very important gut-brain connection, gut-brain ecosystem, and help us understand how the food we eat impacts mental well-being. If you have a headache, the pain is usually perceived in your head somewhere. Um, and you generally will go take a headache pill, um, swallow some water, and hope that the headache goes away. 
But think about it for a second. We're swallowing something. It's going to our digestive tract, but it's working elsewhere in the body, and the pain might be usually somewhere in your head. In a very similar way, the evolution of understanding the gut-brain connection has helped us understand that the food that we eat, the nutrients that we that we eat or don't eat, in the case of maybe eating less healthy choices, are broken down in the digestive tract, but they also interact with trillions of microbes down, down there that are there to actually support digestion, but also work on sleep and circadian rhythm, which is our internal body clock, vitamin production, hormones, uh, immunity, mental health, and more. So that helps us understand that the breakdown of the nutrients, the interaction with neurotransmitters, then starts to impact things like anxiety, mood, and other conditions over time. That's a, that's a simple version of, of, of it. Okay. So like I, I, we love simple versions, but we actually also love complex versions. So one of the things mm -hmm. that I was really surprised by is how scientifically savvy um, the internet is and even our community yes. is. So oh, like yeah. the, the last expert we had on, we were looking at like binding pharmacokinetics of SSRIs and like mm -hmm. everyone could follow what was being said. So we'd love like more details. So like, how does this sure. work? So can you tell us a little bit about, let's say yeah. circadian rhythm and like what I eat? How does like sure. eating something, what is the science behind eating something and how it affects my circadian rhythm? So I have to tell you, circadian rhythm is not my, 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 not my lane of expertise, but what I can speak to is the science of the gut microbiome. Um, when I said circadian rhythm, what I was saying is that our gut microbes actually are involved in so much more than just digestion. Um, I think that understanding that the gut and brain arise from the exact same cells in the human embryo um, is super important because even though they form two different organs in the body, they actually are connected, then they remain connected by the vagus nerve, which allows for messaging between the organ systems of major things like neurotransmitters. The biggest ones that we wouldn't want to be talking about are dopamine, serotonin, GABA. GABA is significantly involved in anxiety. So if we take it a step further, they are communicating about neurotransmitters. 90 to 95% of serotonin and serotonin receptors are in the gut. Now, there's also a smaller percent, much smaller percent in the brain. The serotonin in the gut doesn't actually reach the brain that easily. It doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. And this is where food becomes super important. So things like tryptophan in chickpeas or turkey are hugely important as being precursors to crossing the blood-brain barrier. And by the way, we need to eat these because we need to eat sources of tryptophan in our diet because... Uh, they are the precursors, and because we don't get these naturally in um, in our uh, we, the, our body does not make them. So they cross over and then join with different types of precursors in the brain to form those important uh, neurotransmitters that we need. The other level that we are understanding and learning about is that certain strain of, say, bifidobacterium are involved with serotonin, dopamine, others are involved with GABA, and they're interacting in a way to produce more of these substances. Uh, they also interact with things like cortisol. Now we know that cortisol, GABA, all of these things are linked to our stress response, linked to anxiety. So can, so can, we I, still can I jump in for a second? Picture. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. So, so well, I just want to take each of these in, things in turn. So like let, let, you mentioned tryptophan, right? So let's just understand that. So tryptophan is a serotonin precursor, Yes. right? Um, and so serotonin does not cross the blood-brain barrier, right? Th that's correct. So the serotonin made in the gut doesn't cross over. Right. That's why we need these these foods in our diet to help us. And so once we eat something like chickpeas or turkey that has a higher level of tryptophan, the tryptophan does cross, cross the blood-brain barrier and gets turned yes. into serotonin. That's right. And do we have evidence that shows that eating chickpeas or turkey has a clinical impact on something like anxiety? We do. We have, uh, we have research behind the fact that eating these nutrients, in fact, one of the tricks with tryptophan is tryptophan also needs some form of complex carbohydrate hydrate to be paired with it. 
Um, so I sort of like to joke around, even though it's not the best example, that, you know, the turkey is actually the mashed potatoes that count uh, because that's wow. helping the, tra- the, the, the transport. But I think we want to find, you know, we love mashed potatoes at Thanksgiving, but we want to find uh, more complex carbs that we can work with. But those little nuances are, are important. And I think the overarching message is that food is powerful. We are not at a point of being prescriptive with food. But I think the food is medicine movement and nutritional psychiatry is is helping to move this along. But there's also robust evidence behind the gut microbiome science, um, the science of foods behind anxiety. But I would never want to say, oh, eat chickpeas and your anxiety will be cured. It's part of a holistic approach. So things like learning breath work, a breath work exercise. Hydration, hugely important. Dehydration can precipitate panic. It can, um, so, people can present so with, Dr. with Dr. actual anxiety. Well, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to jump in again. So, so if it's okay, like we're going to take one thing at a time and I'd love to talk about all of these things. So I want to ask you about mm-hmm. dehydration. Sure. I mean, or hydration. I want to yeah, ask yeah. you about mm-hmm. microbiome and just a reminder, you know, like Dr. Uma said, we did a disclaimer at the beginning of stream, but that Everything we're discussing today is for educational purposes only, and nothing should be taken as medical advice. And if you all have a specific question, like, please uh, talk to your doctor or um, whoever your uh, medical professional is. So you mentioned, so trypt- So it sounds like we've got data that shows that dietary consumption of tryptophan, along yes. with carb- complex carbohydrate, and apparently that enhances the absorption of the tryptophan. Do you have a yes, sense of like, do we know how that works? Like, why is that? Uh, I don't know the exact mechanism uh, off the top of my head, but what I understand is that tryptophan um, needs to needs to make that conversion. And the, the carbohydrates actually help it along. Okay. So the best I can say for right now is you know, I think I think if we remember those principles, we want to try to think of how uh, we eat. Remember that complex carbohydrates also come from things like cauliflower. So so it doesn't have to be people think carbohydrates, they think, they think bread, pasta, or potatoes. There are many, there are many more foods. And um, what I do in my book, uh, Calm Your Mind with Food, is actually break down these food groups because they are very confusing to people, macronutrients, micronutrients, bioactives, and all of that, um, so that it helps us to fill out the understanding around food. So what are some of the other, you mentioned that this is a, it's a fascinating nuance. What are some of the other things that people who are struggling with anxiety, like what are some of the other things that they should understand? Like you mentioned that there are principles, right? Which should be part right. of a holistic plan. What are some of these other bits that you've kind of discovered or, or will share with patients or, or you know, people, uh, what right. else can we find in your book? Exactly. So, so food, uh, food and nutrition are the one very solid pillar. But what I want people to understand is those things like hydration are significantly important. Just sipping on water or decaffeinated teas throughout the day um, will actually help your hydration. Uh, Our bodies, by chemical reactions, we know need water, but low hydration actually is associated with anxiety. So just keeping up will help you. Another thing is just learn in your spare time, when you're not feeling anxious, maybe you have a little bit of worry, whatever it is, learn breath work exercise. One of them is called um, alternate nostril breathing. These are simple techniques you can learn from a valid source on YouTube and have that in your back pocket. And the reason that I say that is because when you have that anxiety coming on, you can automatically use breath work. A research study published in 2020 was actually looking at pranayama yoga, which is breath work yoga. And it was looking at cardiovascular patients and they secondarily found that the breath work helped anxiety and depression. So, you know, we're not not just saying learn a breath work exercises that actually can help you. Another piece is just getting some daylight like 10 minutes of daylight every day helps with about 80% of your vitamin D. Can I jump in again? So yeah. I, I've noticed yeah. that you'll give us like two or three different things to do, but we'd love to dive into one mechanism at a time, if that's cool with you. Okay. So sure. you mentioned- you, you, hy- you, You'd stop. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned hydration. So what is like, help us understand the link between hydration and anxiety. So when, when our, our body- our cells need hydration in order to function at a cellular level, at the mitochondrial level. These are just, these are just sort of chemical mechanisms in which our biology happens. When our cells are short on hydration, there is some mechanism that seems to activate what fires in our amygdala, which generally tends to be the hotbed for anxiety. 
So how I want people to think about it is in order to keep your, your stress levels low and to keep yourselves calm, you want to be hydrating because what that's doing is it's kind of, think about it this way, it's sort of filling up your tank of water in your body. But the, the water is distributed throughout your body on a deeper cellular level. It's not just, you know, hydration of your skin, although sometimes that's a great sign of dehydration. So uh, having that as a tool and realizing that you may be drinking a lot of soda, you may be drinking a lot of energy drinks, you may be drinking a diet energy drink. Uh, these are very popular, but those things are not, they, firstly, they're adding either artificial sweeteners or sugar, which is not helping your body, and they're also dehydrating your cells. Although I think that coffee is, uh, is a, a completely okay uh, beverage to have, um, it, coffee itself can be dehydrating. So if you like coffee, make sure you're also drinking water during the day. These are just helpful tips to get us by. Can you tell us a little bit about how artificial sweeteners, because, uh, you know, there's a lot of idea that, okay, if they're, they don't have calories, they're fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah. there's some studies that show, I remember seeing a study that showed that there's a dose-dependent relationship between artificial s sweeteners and risk of dementia. And so what? how does our body metabolize artificial sweeteners? What impact would they have on our mood or anxiety? Right. So let's look at mood and anxiety first. Uh, they tend to, the artificial and non-nutritive sweeteners, they're called non-nutritive because they're not really bringing nutrients to our body. They're just giving that perception of a very sweet taste. Um, so they are disruptive to the gut microbiome. That's one mechanism. But they also do an unusual thing because when you have, if you've ever looked at, you know, a teaspoon of sugar versus a packet of artificial sweetener, there's a tiny bit of powder in the packet and a teaspoon of sugar or a spoon of sugar is a spoon of sugar. But you put in this powder because it's actually hyper sweetened. Um, and what happens is that you, uh, however you're taking it, maybe you're taking it through a diet soda or something like that, the cells in your body, you know, your body thinks, oh, you know, this is something sweet. It, your taste receptors perceive it as sweet. And your body thinks, oh, sugar's coming, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be fed, I'm going to be fed. But what actually happens is that you, you uh, um, consume the artificial sweetener, but it's not followed by any actual food or calories. And so it's a little bit of a trick that gets your body working in the wrong direction. And often people who are consuming a lot of diet soda end up gaining weight for this reason. So it's, it's, it's not not helping the signals in our body it's disrupting the gut microbiome because again the gut microbes want to be fed um, fresh foods or whole foods or fiber uh, it can be frozen foods but actual food versus a, a, a processed ultra processed version of it and that includes artificial sweetness so they are um, they are they are helping your sweet taste but they're not necessarily helping your body or your brain. Um, is there some way that we can center the camera a little bit? I can try it on my end, but I think the bottom of your, if you can tilt it down just a touch. Yeah, maybe a little bit more. There we go. Perfect. That's beautiful. And and by the way, we, we absolutely love that degree of resolution in terms of like, okay, so what I'm hearing about artificial sweeteners is that they trick your taste buds but they trick mm -hmm. other parts of your physiology as well, right? Yeah. So the, they most, right, they, yes, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, go, go for it. Tell us more. So, so these are basically um, weight gain has been associated with things like non nutritive sweetness or artificial sweetness. That's fascinating. These are compounds, right, that are powerful activators um, and our sweet taste receptors in the tongue are the first to perceive them but we also have them elsewhere in the body. And so when these receptors are activated by say having the diet soda or something that has the sweetener, these receptors signal the body that, you know, sugar's coming, I'm going to be fed. Um, but it, so, so, you know, the body starts to remove sugar out of the blood because they perceive more food to be coming. And then you have a sugar crash and you get, you know, you have a low blood sugar. You may not reach hypoglycemia, but it leads you to feel like you need to consume more food. So you, and, and this is something that has been associated with actual weight gain. 
Um, but you have these receptors that perceive the, the sweet taste also in the gut and the liver. And, um, you know, it's, it's just these little nuances matter because sometimes, you know, you want to know more than it's disrupting the gut microbiome because we know that it drives inflammation, it gets, it feeds the gut microbes the wrong type of nutrition that they, they really don't thrive on. And those types of things actually upset the balance in a gut microbiome, which leads to things like inflammation. And inflammation in research is being shown more and more to be associated with conditions like depression and anxiety and even brain fog and and focus attention and memory. So it's a pretty important newer mechanism that we're understanding in mental well-being. Yeah, so that, that's we're going to dive into, I'm going to ask you a ton of questions yeah. about gut microbiome, and I understand we've got maybe about mm-hmm. half an hour left. So I just want to mm-hmm. make sure I, I, I caught this because this is fascinating. So it turns out that artificial sweeteners are associated with weight gain. And one of the reasons for that is that if we think about an artificial sweetener, it tricks our tongue into tasting sweet. But our tongue Mm -hmm. is not the only place where receptors for the artificial sweetener exist. They exist in our liver. They exist in other parts of our body. And then they also trick our body into expecting sweetness or sugar. And food. And And food. food. Yes, exactly. And, And so then what happens is once we trick some of these receptors in our liver and other places our body responds by removing blood uh, sugar from the bloodstream because it's thinking, yes. hey, we're going to be getting a new pile of sugar or nutrients. Right. So we've mm-hmm. got to clean out the bloodstream so that we can start to get more sugar. This That's results right. in a very kind of subclinical hypoglycemia. Mm-hmm. And then as we start to become hypoglycemic and then the, the food doesn't come, right? The nutrients don't come. The sugar doesn't come. Exactly. Then our, then our body's pendulums the other way. And then it says, oh my God, our energy levels are low. And then yeah. it induces potentially cravings and causes cravings us to hunger. actually eat things, which is That's why true. I've seen studies that show, and I, I've seen some of these, that if you, especially if you look mm-hmm. at people who will eat like fast food with a diet soda, they are, mm-hmm. it doesn't actually impact their weight gain at all. And that's because we're activating parts of our body to actually seek out more nutrients. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That That's awesome. So interesting. Do so we get that right? That it, it, yes. No, you got that right. I was going to say that. I want to, I want it also be clear that there are newer sweeteners now. Um, some of them, one of them that I've been studying is allulose. Um, some of the data around erythritol it doesn't, erythritol does not affect insulin resistance. That's a key differentiator may have some other issues, but I also want to point out that, you know, people do look for something sweet and there are some newer sweeteners where all I want you to think about is using a little bit to sweeten something rather than the baking mixes that they now have Mm. of full of and say, well, okay, I'm baking a cake or I'm baking something and I'm going to put two cups of that in to replace something else. I think that that's where we, we, that's a bit of a mixed message because we're not doing our body or brain good. Have a sweetener, have a newer one, and just don't, and use it in moderation. Uh, Remembering that the diet sodas and things, those are really the older sweeteners that are problematic. Okay. And are there other things you mentioned? We'll talk about gut microbiome in a second. You mentioned breath work. Um, We we teach Nari Shuddhi, or alternate nostril breathing here. It's something our community is very familiar with. Um, Good. So... I think that that stuff is great, but are there other things related to anxiety and food, like things that people should know, foods to stay away from, or others, some of these other principles? Like I think this artificial sweet yeah. one is huge. Anything else? It is huge. Um, it, so I was going to make, talk about the vitamin D before I went to okay. the foods to kind of stay away from. Vitamin D is interesting, right? Because we, uh, something I live in the Northeast, we, we, many people are vitamin D deficient. So we, you know, always believe in test, don't guess, check with your doctor, get your level checked. But simple things, spend 10 minutes outdoors before adding sunblock or sunscreen. Um, that will allow for about 80% of your vitamin D requirement for that day. You can fill that in with foods. It doesn't work if you're sitting near a window. You have to be outdoors. Another thing that really helps, and by the way, adequate vitamin D levels or I should say low vitamin D is associated with the low mood and anxiety. So just making sure that you are keeping up with that is important. Shuren yoku, which is forest bathing, um, uh, a, a Japanese description of forest bathing. And, and, you know, what I say to people is maybe you live in a city. Maybe the park is the closest you might come to nature. But that actually is very help, helpful to your body, um, being able to walk in nature. These are things which will actually help 
pull in um, these principles that will help tamp tamper down anxiety. Um, we already, and then also making sure that you're sleeping adequately, because if you're sleeping poorly and um, you you are having disruptive sleep, all of that affects things like even your hunger hormones, and it starts the cycle of disrupting your anxiety. Um, and you know, one of the things that I share in the book is really that it's so linked to our metabolism and, and other things. So we want to we want to keep this front of mind. So you mentioned that you should uh, get 10 minutes of sunlight without sunscreen. What's the relationship between sunscreen and vitamin D? So if you're wearing uh, sun sunblock or sunscreen, you're not your skin is not going to absorb it that well, right? That because you you basically are protecting yourself from certain rays of the sun. And we, we encourage sunscreen and sunblock because of the high levels of skin cancer in this country uh, and worldwide. So the idea is allow for that natural absorption. Vitamin D interacts with your skin. It forms enough that you need at least 80% of what you need for that day. But then I want people to be cautious because this is not a message of, oh, just spend time. And we, we love the sun. We want sunlight because it's good for our bodies. It's good for our mood. But we want to be careful after a certain point that we are protecting from the uh, damaging rays of the sun that can damage our skin. Okay, interesting. So so the, the UVB, that I think that's primarily what's blocked. I forget if it's UVA or UVB. So there is actually, like, do we know, is there science behind sunscreen usage and lower levels of vitamin D production? The, the, the certainly, yes. So use of sunscreen definitely impacts vitamin D. That's why, the, that's why I'll describe it this way. Interesting. And so you also said something about the, the dietary vitamin D that we get. Is that insufficient compared to what we get from sunlight or is there some difference between those two? I, here's why I shared it as a tip because you was, you was saying, let's look at some of the holistic measures. It's an easy thing to do. To step outside, we should be stepping outside um, for a few minutes every day. Anyway, you know it's tough in the Zoom world, but um, it's an easy thing to do. So why not do something that's easy and then fill it in with the way that you're eating? Um, I feel that the more times we have lower barriers to improve improve how we're feeling, like stepping outside, it, it just becomes easier. Awesome. And so you, uh, you've mentioned gut microbiome a couple of times. Can you help us understand? So I know that there are studies that show that even, for example, like certain subtypes of bacteria are more common with people who have high levels of anxiety. Certain types of bacteria are common with people who have high levels of a mood disorder. There are also now, um, I think, like clinical studies trialing stool transplants. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those have actually shown some promising clinical results and a stool transplant is what exactly, how does that work, Dr. Naidu? Uh, well, I'll tell you a fascinating study, um, actually in schizophrenia. There was a study uh, that uh, used a fecal uh, uh, microbiome transplant and how that works is it's, um, it's actual, it, it's done obviously in a clinical uh, sanitary way so that it can be done easily. But this particular research study took the microbiome from uh, patients who had active schizophrenia symptoms and transplanted the microbiome through an FMT into What's mice. What's an FMT? A fecal uh, microbi microbiome, tra uh, microbiome transplant. And the mice developed symptoms of schizophrenia. So, so, what... so let me just understand that correctly. We took a human... Human with schizophrenia. With schizophrenia. We took mm -hmm. their poop, mm -hmm. right? We took their feces. Yes. We implanted mm -hmm. it in a mouse, mm -hmm. and the mouse exhibited symptoms of schizophrenia. Schizophrenia. Now, how do we detect schizophrenia in a mouse? Do you have any idea? <laughs> Listen, that, I would love to know that myself. That goes beyond but my understanding. Exactly, of... I was fascinated by the study. You know, I think that they looked at the they looked at certain behaviors in the mice, and they. Uh, were able to track them. So it is a fascinating question. What I thought was very powerful about the study was that that is coded in the, you know, when we say use the word microbiome, we are referring to the genetic material along with the microbes. What I think was fascinating is it's it was the fact that we, yes, we're removing the poop, but we're doing it through an FMT from the microbiome and we're placing it in these animals and it's changing their behavior. Yeah. You know, so I think that 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 to me was a, a just a powerful indicator of where we can go. You know, sorry. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's that's especially interesting because when we think about, you know, clinically about schizophrenia, I, I sort of was taught, um, yeah. you know, by a faculty at, like yourself that, that schizophrenia is basically uncurable, that, that we don't really have any good evidence that, yeah. that, or I mean, some people may disagree and there are some studies and stuff out of like Lapland, Norway and things like that about sustained remission or potentially cure. There are certainly psychoanalytic perspectives, but I, I think, I mean, going through my clinical training, I sort of felt like depression and anxiety are much more curable or we can put those into sustained remission, whereas schizophrenia mm -hmm. feels a lot more untreatable. Like if we look at just the, the trajectories of people with schizophrenia, they, you know, depression, right. maybe some people can get better. But it's really fascinating to see that even in such a intractable, biologically based illness, that we can see improvements. So let's talk a little. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. sorry. So, no, so I, I agree with that. And, you know, there are some dietary measures that have been looked at um, that uh, could potentially help conditions like both bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, which in our training, we were certainly taught with the more serious and severe conditioning, a condition. So I agree with you on that. Um, one of them is the ketogenic diet. And one of the things I would say about that is this, there's some good evidence behind it. Uh, but I think we also know that not all schizophrenics uh, come with the resources, uh, not individuals with schizophrenia have the resources to have someone help them count their micros, their macros, and manage their diet. They may live in a residential group home and not have access to just healthy whole foods. They may have state-aided foods, which could be sliced bread and pasta. So, yeah. So, can you just important to understand. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I, I think um, what I'm hearing from you is that a lot of our beliefs about schizophrenia may come from the situations that these people live in. So it's not so much that the illness is not improvable or even curable. It's that these people are some of the people in society that have kind of the worst environment. If we're talking about holistic health, they're right. the, the place that they live, the kinds of foods that they eat, they have so many disadvantages outside of the disease process of schizophrenia right. that really res could be responsible for the very poor outcomes that we see, which makes perfect sense to me. Um, can you talk I agree a little, with that. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about ketogenic diet? So like, what is the mm -hmm. impact of ketogenic diet on something like an anxiety disorder, panic attacks? Right. So it, it certainly has been helpful. One of the things I talk about is a kind of a, you know, an ad adaptation of the keto diet, and it can be helpful. I think that in in my clinical practice, I've only used it in a short form nature with individuals. And that beca that's because my view of the research is that it's not sustainable for a lot of people. So it can be very helpful, things like therapeutic carbohydrate reduction in someone who has gained weight from a um, from a, an antipsychotic medication or other medication uh, in psychopharmacology that cause, causes weight gain or metabolism metabolic changes can be really helpful, meaning that you balance up the type of carbohydrates that you're eating and that that is not the main focus of your meal. You remember the food pyramid from way back was completely backwards, right? It had us eating mm. multiple servings of bread, rice, pasta, whatever it was. Um, and <laughs> that has really evolved and changed over time. And we understand things a little bit better. So it's, it's helping someone tweak that and giving them the support to, to do so. So it can be very helpful in certain conditions, um, in, in these conditions to help someone eat, also gain, lose some weight from these side effects, but also met metabolically improve the symptoms. So can you tell us what, what do you mean by this term therapeutic carbohydrate reduction? It's actually a term that is used to help us understand the it's almost un understanding the types of carbohydrates we can consume and understanding that a carbohydrate can come from cauliflower, which is very low in calorie um, and high in fiber and other nutrients that our body needs versus a pasta or a slice of bread and using those uh, in a therapeutic way, but reducing the kind of bread pasta that we've been taught to eat in a way that still balances up your macronutrients and micronutrients and helps your dietary kind of improvement in this condition. Yeah, so uh, uh, Dr. Uma, I've got kind of a, a different sort of non-scientific question for you, but that hopefully oh, yeah, sure. your expertise can help us with. Sure. I just like bread and pasta more than cauliflower. So when you're right, working right. with people, <laughs> How do you actually 
<laughs> like, how do you eat healthy? Right. So you're saying all this stuff, oh, like microbiome and this and that, and like cut out this <laughs> and cut out that. And but like from the practical <laughs> perspective, like let's say I'm like 25 years old or 24 years old. I've got a roommate or two and like, we're like living there. Right. I, I work for eight hours a day. I commute for like 75 minutes a day. I do laundry mm -hmm. and I have to like sustain myself. Like, I, you know, it's not like I have all the money in the world. Uh, how, how does one practically like eat healthy? Like what works for your patients? First and foremost, I think it's, it really starts with uh, feeling the urge, the motivation, the the emotional kind of um, signal that you want to make a change right because it's i fundamentally believe a lot that many of us know when you've been to school or we've studied uh things in science we know what healthy eating is but it's really hard for people to implement it a busy mom busy family busy busy younger person has so much going on i usually start with what's bothering you most about your diet with some of my patients it might be hey, during COVID, I eat, began eating ice cream every day. You know, I can only afford fast food. I really can't start shop at the supermarket because those foods are too expensive. So what do I do? It's so much easier to pick up this burger and fries and I get a free soda with it. Why would I, you know, go Diet cook soda. a cauliflower? Diet soda. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know uh, make make it the large fries but also you know i'm not going to go to the supermarket and cook something so it has to start with something that you want to change because if not it's there isn't really a lever for you to make a change and that's sort of more of the psychology uh, psych psychology of eating part of it and so so i'm in i'm in a slightly advantaged position because the people coming to my clinic have all been referred because they're interested in that work if someone is listening to this new field, well, you know, this is just feels too hard. One of the things I do in my books is I break down shopping lists. I break down foods that you can eat. All things, by the way, you can take photographs of and keep on your phone. Foods to avoid or to cut back on a certain condition. Here's one. Nitrates in processed meats have been shown to worsen depression. Uh, simple thing, but you know, that could help you choose, um, that could help you make a healthier choice the next time. Maybe... Uh, buy a roasted chicken breast from the store instead of the, the processed deli meat version of it. Um, so I think that start with something that's bothering you. If Let me give you a few examples. If it's the ice cream, um, there's a way to make ice cream from bananas, and you can even make a chocolate flavor with cacao flavonols, which are great for your brain. So there are ways around this because I don't demonize sugar, but I want people to know that sugar, added sugars are just not the best option for us. So here's here are some things, you know, say you don't want to cook breakfast. Can you get small a small plain yogurt and eat it with berries, even frozen blueberries and a bit of cinnamon? Because that will save you on tons of added sugar calories from the fruited yogurt that will be on sale each week in the supermarket. So things that you can do, you don't actually have to cook the food, but choose whole foods. And by the way, there are even non-dairy versions of uh, probiotic rich yogurts now. So this, this, there's a few choices we can make. Yeah, that's awesome. So I'm so curious. So can, can you tell us a little bit about the nit nitrates and their effect on depression? So some some research showed that uh, for, for some reason, um, the nitrates, especially that are found in these processed meats, and part of it is the fact that these meats are, you know, they, they look the way that they do, but they're actually highly processed to get to that stage versus if you do consume meat and you go to the, the store or the butcher and you see a piece of chicken breast, it's a piece of chicken breast. It's it's come, it's been taken or removed and, and the butcher's done what he needed to do. The sliced deli meat has been highly processed to get to that point. It has preservatives, additives, and lots of things. And one of them is nitrates. And for whatever reason, it seemed to have caused people to be more depressed when, when they ate it. So if you're eating a lot of that, maybe something to think about. Interesting. So so we're not quite sure what the mechanism behind processed meats and, and nitrates. So it seems to be nitrates in it, and that somehow negatively affects our mood and is associated yes. with depression. So what about some of these things like intermittent fasting or super high protein diets? Um, some people are even on something like called the carnivore diet where they like eat mm -hmm. exclusively meat. Uh, mm -hmm. w w what do we know about intermittent fasting and mental health or high amounts of protein or meat intake in mental health? Sure. So with intermittent fasting, there's really good body of evidence for physical health 
for autophagy, cellular turnover, uh, resting our body and being able to consume uh, calories in a certain window of time and be fasting the rest of the time. Windows tend to vary for men and women. And um, how so? I, what, so women, men tend to be able to tolerate uh, longer hours of fasting than women. And that's been, that happened to be shown in research as for the reason I, I don't know off, off the top of my head. But I think that that's, an, that's one important difference. Um, I think that what we don't necessarily know yet is intermittent fasting and mental health. Anecdotally, my patients who actually tolerate fasting under my guidance or the guidance of another physician actually say that they feel clearer, they have less brain fog, they have more energy. So I think that that is positive and worth, worth researching. Some of the difficulties, though, that I want to point out with things like intermittent fasting is people interpret these things differently. Um, I've met some young women recently who were eating for two and a half hours of the day and fasting the rest of the day, which which is, by the way, extreme. Um, you know, and when asked if they exercise and are able to be active, they actually reported all different demographics, different parts of the country, not patients of mine, reported feeling really weak and not being able to exercise. So for me, that's a bit of a miss because leading that or trying to achieve a better lifestyle, there's no perfect lifestyle, none of us is perfect, but being able to exercise and, and be outdoors and do this type of thing, if you don't have the energy, should you really be eating for two and a half to three hours a day? Shouldn't it be a little bit longer? So some of that, like, as you know, as a psychiatrist, this can tip over into things like eating disorders or disordered eating of some mm -hmm. kind. Um, so I would be careful about that. So good, good if uh, intermittent fasting works for you, you naturally fast, you have a, a good solid plan of hours that you eat and it's resting your body the rest of the time, great. Um, with... Um, with the, the extreme diets, whether it's carnivore or a fully vegan, I think that that my position on eating is really centered on food equity. And what I mean by that is if you if you eat chicken, beef, and cauliflower, and that's what you like to eat, basically, I'm going to work with you to tweak what you're eating to the best available foods that you have access that you have for your mental well-being. I don't feel it's my role to tell you to be carnivore or vegan. Uh, I think that with the extreme dieting, people it works for people and uh, that's good for them, but they are missing on nutrients from some foods. If a carnivore is never eating vegetables, we need a lot of those phytonutrients from vegetables. If a plant-based person is never going to eat um, meat or fish, they might miss out on omega-3 fatty acids from seafood and vitamin B12, which is mostly found in um, animal sources. So they might need to supplement with nutritional yeast, a vitamin B supplement, algal oil supplements, et cetera. So I don't think there's a perfect diet. I think we take what we like to eat and we tweak it. I feel like the diet culture in this country divides people and confuses them. So- um, How so? All, because when, when um, physicians, influencers, um, uh, individuals who opine on a certain eating pattern come out and say never eat spinach or only eat spinach, something is missing in the balanced plate of both those individuals. And I feel that the that in this country, there's a huge focus on weight loss and self-help, and that's great. But what about our metabolic health? What about our mental health? They are all connected. You know, you can't supplement a bad diet, you can't exercise out of a bad diet. So I think that just going back to more whole foods that we can eat to the best of your ability, whatever your situation may be, I think is a better choice in um, just in moving moving the conversation forward. Protein is hugely important. You asked about that um, and we should be getting enough of it, but I'll tell you most Americans lack fiber in their diet. So just eating vegetables, you get, get fiber from plant-based sources. So vegetables, um, uh, fruit, beans, nuts, seeds, legumes, healthy whole grains. You you can't get fiber from meat or, or seafood. So just make sure you're having that balance because fiber is what feeds your microbiome. Interesting. Okay. So so um, if I'm, let me just make sure I kind of heard you. So I, I really love your approach of like kind of meeting people where they're at, right? So you, when someone comes to you, it's sort of starting with, okay, like 
where do you want to make a change? First of all, what's mm -hmm. your motivation to make a change? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what are some alternatives? So it's not that you have to eat fiber or you have to eat spinach. In fact, I, I, what I'm hearing you kind of say is it's kind of a problem because right now we live in a, a, a society and about 50% of our audience is from North America, by the way. Okay. So you're, you're talking to everyone, including people from Ethiopia and Malaysia and in the Philippines awesome. and all over the awesome. place. Um, and, and so I, I really love kind of your perspective, which is that if someone comes to you and says, hey, I want to be on the carnivore diet, you're like, OK. Or, hey, I want to be vegan. You're like, OK. And, and everyone out there right now is saying this is bad or this is good or you should try this and I feel amazing or whatever. But that what you really try to do is start with with people where they are. And then right. what's one thing that we can do that will sort of move you in the direction that we, you need to go? And then and, Correct. Yeah. Any diet out there, it may have some kind of deficiency. It doesn't matter which spectrum you're on. And I love this, what you said about whether someone's saying eat only spinach or never eat spinach. Both of those have a problem, right? And, and then I'm also hearing that, um, and, and if you can just show us your, your book real quick. Okay. So I, I don't think people can see oh, that see it because it's out of frame. It's in, it's in the corner, but I have one yeah. right here. So this so, is the book called so, Time Your Mind with Food. And, and this is my first book. I'll show, you, I'll show you both while I have it. So this is the first book which kind of covers all mental health conditions. And this is the book that's new, that's coming out, that's really about helping anxiety. Um, and helping people eat for their better control and management of worry and anxiety and stress. That's awesome. Um, and, and what I also kind of, what I heard you mention is that if we sort of think about how do I eat healthy? So sure, it starts with motivation, but then we're inundated with so much information. And so right. it sounds like you've got a lot of stuff in there Conflict just, to, uh, just about, yeah, yeah, conflicting information. So just, you've got some resources in there that sort of almost offload the cognitive part, right? So you've kind of figured things out for people. They can take a look at a list and they can figure out what kind of applies to them. Correct. And and, and can, what condition condition applies to them. So in my first book, say you have a family member with PT, PTSD, but you're struggling with depression. You know, you just try out different parts of the book, different parts of the plan and do what works for you. Um, I think that, you know, a study showed that 70% of individuals globally, especially since you have a global audience, never see a mental health professional, never see a mental health professional, which means and speaks to us having more solutions for those of us out there who may never see you or me um, in, a in a professional capacity, maybe, you know, uh, and, and so food, since we're eating, even if you're intermittent fasting, maybe you're having one meal a day, it's something we're all doing. And it is a powerful um, vector that we can change. Awesome. So are there other things, like any interesting like mechanisms? You mentioned gut microbiome. Maybe we can talk about yeah. that. So what's the relationship between gut microbiome, food, and anxiety? So the um, when we go back to those gut microbes and them digesting the food, um, they uh, are involved in several reactions as food is, is broken down. And what we now understand is there's even kind of more cool stuff like different different types of bacteria that interact with food. So here's a few. Lactobacillus plantarum influences dopamine and serotonin levels that help mood and anxiety. Um, when it comes to specifically anxiety, there's another identified bacteria called Lactobacillus helveticus that lowers cortisol levels and therefore helps anxiety. We know that when we're stressed and cortisol levels are high, we know that that can be problematic for levels of anxiety. Um, another bacteria um, it actually eases anxiety symptoms is Lactobacillus casei. So the, we're now knowing the different, we're understanding a little bit more on the microbiome level of what the different micro, uh, uh, the different microbes are actually doing. So I feel like one of the directions I'm really hoping um, we go in is um, psychobiotics. So psychobiotics is basically the use of uh, pre and probiotics in foods to improve mental health symptoms. And what it will do is circumvent the need in some individuals for the use of a prescription medication. Um, another powerful one, by the way, uh, lactobacillus rhamnosus, which actually targets those um, GABA receptors. So as we learn to fill in more of this information, we are understanding the power of what we can do to positively manipulate the microbiome for our mental well-being.
So you mentioned these these various kinds of lactobacillus, but like yep. I'm sitting here at home, how do I get the benefit of whatever lactobacillus you're talking about? Very easy. One of the ways to think about this is that the food we eat, they each have a microbiome. So if you're eating, remember, you know, if I think about a a dish, a, a plate that you're eating. And I want it to be a lot of plant foods because they give you fiber, phytonutrients, and vitamins and minerals. And each of those plants has a microbiome of their own. So by eating those foods, as well as eating fermented foods, fermented foods, almost every culture has one, kimchi, kefir, uh, kombucha, whatever it is that, that you enjoy, Try to add those in because fermented foods have live active cultures. By eating these foods, you are actually gathering as many of these microbes into your diet. Specifically, if you want that strain, we'd have to go in the direction of microbiome testing. We'd have to look at companies that are more private uh, in the private sector that can test your microbiome and say, hey, look, you probably need to eat these foods and take these supplements to help along your microbiome. Um, and that's when you get into the more details and specifics. But the overarching message is you will start to get these microbes if you're just uh, eating more of those whole foods and you are focusing on things like prebiotic foods, which garlic leeks, onions, bananas, um, fermented foods, like what, I mentioned. What is a prebiotic food? Pre what does that mean? Prebiotic foods. So prebiotics are what feeds your gut microbes, but prebiotics can be a supplement, but they can be obtained from actual food. Garlic, leeks, onions, uh, bananas, jicama, uh, Jerusalem artichokes, lots of different veggies actually have that. So you can eat it through food. You don't have to take a supplement. Um, so getting all of these pieces in and paying attention to fermented foods, which give you like live active cultures that enter your body and enter your microbiome are really just helping you, helping you fill in this picture. Okay. And you mentioned um, uh, trauma. So I, I know we've got maybe about five to 10 minutes left. Just let us know, you know, which of those is closer to what works for you. But um, so you so you mentioned uh, in your first book, you talked a little bit about PTSD. And I, I've, I've seen a ton of research on mood disorders, um, even a little bit of research on psychotic disorders, anxiety disorders. But I, I really haven't seen much about trauma because I, I sort of think about trauma as, you know, kind of like a psychological or sometimes physical thing that happens to you. But what is the relationship between trauma and like gut health? Right. So, you know, um, trauma, uh, we know, well, let me start with this. The microbes uh, respond to things like emotional changes. You have a fight with your boss, something's not going well at work. The microbes actually have been shown to respond in a certain way. So they're, they're pretty sensitive to emotions as well as to food and other things like stress. Wait, hold on, mm -hmm. you just blew my mind. How, how does that work? How is a microbe responsible to my emotions? So when, you know, uh, when, when you have, when you experience stress, the, the microbes sense that. And they are part of your body, right? They're not a separate entity. They're all, they're all part of it. So if you are emotionally experiencing something, they start to respond. Um, and based on that, we now know that there's a pretty fascinating research on things like blueberries. And uh, this was done in an animal, animal model of PTSD um, and basically helped us understand that eating blueberries on a regular basis can actually fend off some of the oxidative stress associated with PTSD and can help. So it's it just little things that um, pull out the information we have and gives us a little bit more to work on. Um, this particular study was done in 2016. Um, it really looked at PTSD as a uh, stress-related disorder and uh, looked at the process, the underlying process of oxidative stress and inflammation specifically mm -hmm in the prefrontal cortex, cortex and the hippocampus. Um, usually, look, as you know, we prescribe SSRIs for these conditions, but often their effect is marginal, if any. So having more tools in the toolbox, in addition to psychotherapy and other forms of therapy like EMDR and things like that become really important for, for people to, to have. So uh, when you said these effects are marginal, you're talking about trauma disorders and, and SSRIs, or you're talking about anxiety yeah. disorders? 
I was talking about trauma because you'd okay. asked me about trauma. Yeah, but yeah. by the way, they also have very limited effects in anxiety. And research has shown um, that, in fact, only about 25% of people actually improve when they take an SSRI medication. A huge number of people have a marginal effect and others have no effect at all. So, you know, again, speaking to the fact that uh, by all means, that doesn't mean someone should stop their medication. Always speak to your doctor because these things are hugely important. But you may be taking something, and if you're not finding that you're getting an improvement in your symptoms, then advocating for longer conversation with your doctor to see what other options exist become important. Yeah, so how do you as a psychiatrist kind of like, what's your what's your rubric for combining, let's say, something like an SSRI for an anxiety disorder with food? Like, how do you practically approach it? I approach it, I have three three sort of groups of individuals who approach me. Um, one group is uh, being prescribed a medication and they want to use nutrition to tweak what they're doing. And in that group of people, depending on the severity of their symptoms, we can sometimes stay at the same medication or even over time lower their medications while using and seeing if nutritional interventions make a difference. Another group of people are individuals who are feeling anxiety, feeling symptoms, and they really want to take a more holistic approach, but they're also not so sick. They're not actively psychotic. They're not suicidal. They're not homicidal. Um, they're not manic, for example, and they can be functioning, but they're not feeling great. And they're a great group and a lot, the, probably the largest part of my practice who want to come in and tweak their diet and lifestyle factors, uh, work on their metabolic health in order to improve their symptoms. And then the third group are just individuals who are trying to see what would work. They may or may not be on medication um, and, and, and sort of looking to, they may actually have a different condition and come from a different specialty entirely. It might be a referral from my favorite an orthopedic surgeon, uh, <laughs> you know, or, or an infectious disease doctor who sent a patient to see me, but very specific related conditions that they wanted to work on that actually had, had come about on account of their medical, um, primary medical condition. Interesting. Okay, so it, it sounds like you get different kinds of patients, and depending on where they're coming from and what their goals are, you really try to find a balance between medication or not medication. I, I think you are one of the growing number of psychiatrists, and this is probably a selection bias on my part, who is finding um, a decreasing value towards pharmacology as a, as a singular approach. So yes. I, I know my clinical experience was just that the more I practice psychiatry, the more I find that medications really don't fix problems and that there's a subset yeah. of patients. I would say for about a third of my patients, they really have a significant benefit. And, yeah. and for some people, they really can be quite life changing. But that mm -hmm. the idea that the average person is going to have a life changing experience after starting a medication is something that I've sort of learned the hard way is not the case. It's not that easy. Yeah. Yeah. And and as sort of the relative value of medication. I've seen a lot of kind of post-market studies about the percentage of SSRIs that are actually placebo as opposed to like a pharmacologic yeah. benefit. That number seems to be growing and growing and growing. The more important some of these things like food become. So as we're learning right. more about the science, as we're learning more about gut microbiome and inflammation and things like that. Um, so I, I guess my last question for you is if someone's like interested in this, Right. Let's say that I'm someone out there and I have anxiety and I want to mm -hmm. do something for my health. Where right. can we get more information? I mean, do you have a clinic? Do you see people? Um, you know, what what's the next step for me if I want to yeah. get better with my anxiety and I want to do something about it? What should I do? So look, I um, have a very, I have a waitlisted clinic right now. So I, I wouldn't want to misinform people and say, hey, just contact me because right now we're not at that place, but we're trying to grow our resources and we're trying to train more clinicians to do this kind of work. Um, the best way to get started uh, to understand my work is actually, believe it or not, to start working through my books because they walk you through lists of food, types of foods to eat, types of foods to cook, easy recipes. Um, I started cooking later in life, so I know it's not easy. So I, I, I wanted to make it really accessible for people. Um, like I said, take photographs of different lists and use them when you use supermarketing or doing your online shopping. Calm Your Mind with Food, the book that I've just written, is about filling that gap. Twenty-five. There has been a 25% increase in anxiety since COVID 
as published in The Lancet. So we know that many more people are suffering. We know that early times of COVID, Zoloft went on shortage because there were so many new prescriptions for anxiety. Um, so the way to get started is to work through the science in the book, uh, understand the micronutrients, or just go to the third part, which is how do you solve the problem? List of foods to shop for, um, an anti-anxiety shopping list, a few pages of a protocol you can follow, uh, easy recipes that you can make at home that are interchangeable, whether you you kind of were a vegan, um, and uh, ways that you can feel better. It, it's meant to be filling that gap while you might be made to see a therapist or a doctor, or you just want to try something on your own and tweak your diet in a slightly healthier way. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. I think one of the things that I really like about resources like yours is that um, one of the things that I think is actually like a big problem in our mental health system is that the majority of our mental health professionals have no training in the body. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, I, yeah. I think psychologists and, and clinical social workers and stuff, they're all amazing people, but just the way that they're yeah. educated. A yeah. And I think that worked fine, and it's still very effective. So we know that psychotherapy is an incredibly effective um, intervention. But I think the more that we're learning that the mind is actually part of the body, I, I find right. that more and more psychologists and, and, and social workers and stuff that I've worked with are like getting into it. And it's, it's really right. problematic because I think a lot of people will see only a therapist and they'll never see a medical doctor, which is fine right. because the majority of psychiatrists out there are primarily psychopharmacologists. They have 15 yeah. minute med visits, they prescribe a medication and then it's out the door or they'll see a nurse practitioner right. or something like that. But, right. but I, I think it's really hard because we, we, we are seeing so many studies about the benefits of food probiotics, prebiotics, whatever. And so how do you incorporate that if you're just seeing a therapist? And that's why I'm really glad that we have people like you writing books like the ones that you're writing. Thank um, you. I appreciate that. So thank you so much. And uh, we hope to see you back. I, I have many more questions yeah. about other illnesses and, and especially like trauma and PTSD, because that's yeah. one thing I'm really curious about kind of what you think about that. But Thanks a lot. I will definitely be back. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was great to talk to all of you. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. We're good. I'm still streaming, yes. but you're, they can hear you. But thanks a lot, Thank Dr. You. Uma. Bye. Okay. How was that, chat? Screw carnivore and vegan. I'm beating both. That's the that's the strat. Um. Yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, Doctor Naidu is fantastic. Um, I, I, this is my actually first time talking to her, but she's. Uh, I, I know people that know her very, 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 very well. Um, and and so strongly recommend y'all check out her book. I mean, she's. I, I don't think she kind of mentioned this, but she's also like, you know, I don't know if she's still there, but was faculty at Harvard for a long time and all that kind of stuff. She didn't toot her own horn. Um, but she she's awesome, and and that's why I actually really loved like training there because it, it's awesome. You have all of these like experts who like I, I mean I've never met someone who is a psychiatrist and then like went to culinary school and then is a nutritional biologist, right? So this is kind of like so y'all have Dr. K and Dr. K is like pseudo monk became a psychiatrist, whatever is an influencer, I guess. So like there are a couple of different slices, and the really awesome thing is that there are people out there who are like other kinds of like amalgamations, right? They're Frankensteinian monsters of nutritional biology, chef, and medical doctor and mental health professional. And so if y'all really wanna understand stuff, I, I think her book is also, like she said, pretty practical. So my experience of what makes adopting a diet hard is there are a couple of different pieces of it. So this is why people can't eat healthy. So there are a couple things we gotta understand. The first is that we're habituated to eat a, a particular way. So if you grew up eating something, your neurons get wired so that you reach for those things when your body sends you signals. So if I grow up in, a, in an environment of processed food and like eating fast food, which is what I, how I grew up, now even today when I feel hungry, what does my brain, what is the experience of my brain for what solves hunger? I know that fast food is gonna solve my hunger. So what's happened is that our brain has been conditioned because when we feel hungry, this is what makes it go away. And the more you do that as a child, that's what gets baked in. 
So this is when your brain is wiring in this way. It's also learning other fundamentals of life like gravity, like what is the force of gravity? How high do I need to jump or how hard do I need to jump to reach this particular place? So we're wiring and we have all of this habitual circuitry going on in our brain. The second problem that people have with eating healthy is that they don't have the right motivation. And what do I mean by that? So if we look at like motivation, motivation is not intellectual. So you can watch something like this, you can see someone else who's healthy and you can think, oh my God, I need to eat healthy. But this is an intellectual thought. The parts of your brain and body that select foods are not the same parts that want to eat healthy. So this is a huge discrepancy, right? Because your brain is saying one thing and your stomach and your tongue are saying something else. Those, by the way, are just different parts of your brain. It's all coming from your brain in some way or vice versa. So the other thing is that you really have to connect with your emotional need is the simplest way to put it, your motivational drive to really eat healthy. So what I would ask you is what is it worth to you to eat healthy? And it can't be an answer like, oh, like I want to be healthy because that's a good thing, right? I want to exercise every day because that's a good thing. I want to do yoga for an hour every day because that's a good thing. I want to, you know, go out and feed the homeless because that there's a thousand things out there that are that should be good things. But the real question is why does it matter to you? And if it doesn't matter to you, then it's not going to work. And like let's let me give you all a simple example. So some people will say, "Well, I want to eat healthy because I feel embarrassed." every time I go to the beach because my friends take off their shirt and I'm not very sexy. So when I take off my shirt, I feel embarrassed. And so your brain then has a problem, right? Which is that when I take off my shirt, I feel embarrassed and we want to avoid that. And here's your fucking head, which is like, okay, if I eat healthy for six months or nine months and I exercise every day, I can fix that problem. Because then when I take off my shirt, I will feel proud of myself. But the thing is, your brain is an efficient organ. It's not an inefficient organ. So the brain comes up with another solution. Hey, you don't feel good when your shirt is off at the beach? I can fix that without nine months of working out and eating healthy and suffering and doing hard things. I can fix that so much easier. Just don't go. Problem solved. Right? Because at the end of the day, the situation is the same. You can take off your shirt and you can feel good about yourself, or you can just avoid going in the first place. And so the problem that we, we're dealing with in society today is that our brain is really, really efficient. It's figured out alternatives to the healthy things. And so this is why if you really want to eat healthy, you really have to think a little bit about what, what is this worth to me? What am I willing to sacrifice it? For it, And this is where unless, so if we look at the sacrifice required to eat healthy in terms of lack of enjoyment, willpower, effort, money, not being able to play video games, not being able to relax more because now you got to cook the amount of hours I have to spend cleaning, right? Because everyone's like, oh yeah, like cooking healthy is so great. Everyone says you should cook at home. Whoever talks about cleaning, like cleaning is a pain in the ass. Do you guys get that? Like, I don't have to clean anything ever if I just eat out. It's just, you eat out is a disposable container, nice disposable container. Can you imagine how crappy like purchasing food outside and fast food was if you ever had to do dishes? So half of eating healthy is not even about food. It's about the cleaning. So you have to really figure out something within you that makes it worth the pain in the ass. A couple of other things that people don't understand about eating healthy is that when you crave things, it's not actually you craving it. It's actually your gut microbiome craving it. So some of the most fascinating research that I've looked at, and I'll try to pull up a reference, shows that, so this is what, what Dr. Naidu was talking a little bit about. So when I have a set of gut bacteria, if I eat a particular diet, okay, what happens is the foods that I eat will select for some kinds of bacteria. So there's some bacteria that can break down broccoli, and there's some bacteria that will survive off of french fries. And these bacteria are two different sets of bacteria because one of, can, one of them can break down things like cellulose and like other kinds of like complex fibers, and they can eat that. And there's a bacteria that's like, nah, brah, we want like oil and simple carbohydrates, potatoes. And so then what happens is if I'm used to eating french fries and I stop eating french fries, the French fry eating bacteria start to die. 
And as they start to die, they increase inflammation, which then makes us feel more depressed, feel more anxious, which in turn then fatigues our frontal lobes, right? So the more inflamed our brain is, the less energy it has, the less willpower we have. When you have the flu, you don't have the willpower to do anything. That's because you have a whole body inflammation going on. As our willpower declines, then our ability to control our impulses drops. So as those French fry eating bacteria start dying, they're like, I may die, but my friend over there that also eats french fries, I'm going to save my friend by fatiguing your brain, and then you will crave french fries, and then we'll save them. There's even some evidence that as these bacteria die, they start to release chemical messengers that travel to your brain and literally stimulate. So this is not just whole body inflammation. That That's just like, it's like a general whole body inflammation that fatigues your brain. It's not specific. But these bacteria also have guided missiles. So they secrete particular neurotransmitters that do cross the blood-brain barrier and induce cravings for some kinds of food. So if we sort of stop and think about it, this is how craving works, right? So if I crave water, how does that work? It's because there's something somewhere that is secreting a chemical signal. In this case, it could be coming from someplace like the kidney, which measures our fluid balance and stuff like that. Or even there are cer certain carotid baroreceptors. There are receptors over here. There are receptors around the heart. There are all these kinds of receptors that will detect our fluid level. And then they send signals to parts of our brain to have us crave water. Oh my God, I'm so thirsty. Oh my God, I'm so thirsty. Oh my God, I'm so thirsty, right? And in that same way, these bacteria will send signals too that will cause cravings. So this is why eating healthy is hard. It's not just like, oh my God, that guy over there is eating healthy and therefore it should be easy for me. No, you are actually moving against your body when you are eating healthy. See, everyone thinks that eating healthy is healthy and your body will want it. It's actually the opposite. Your body doesn't want to eat healthy because millions of years ago when our body was evolving, it was like, oh, I can eat this tuber, which is very low caloric density, or I can eat butter. And if I eat butter, the likelihood that I will live is actually better. And so we have all of this stuff that has been engineered in our body to survive in calorie deficient situations, right? This is what most animals do. Most animals, a struggle for life is a struggle for calories. This is why grizzly bears will fight each other to be able to eat salmon. And so now what's happened is we have such an abundance of, of calories that our body is actually working against us. Now that which allowed us to survive has suddenly become that which kills us. More people die of obesity and diabetes than they do of starvation in the world today. This is the problem that we live with. So everyone's talking about eating healthy as if it's a good thing. It's not a good thing. It's not actually what your body is designed to do. Your body's working against you. And so that's why if you really want to eat healthy, you have to first of all understand this and understand that what you're really dealing with is about somewhere probably around 21 days of hardship. So this is the other thing that a lot of people need to get. So if it takes maybe about two to three weeks, this is kind of my clinical and personal experience, for your body bacteria to overhaul. So I don't know exactly how long they're alive and things like that, but if you can kind of make it to the two-week mark, three-week mark, then there's a good chance that you'll do a lot better. And for those of y'all that have tried dieting, you'll know kind of what I'm talking about because for the first two days, dieting is easy, right? You can give something up for two days. Why is it that dieting gets hard at the week-long mark? It's because that's when these bacteria start to die. They've stored up some stuff in the bank. They can survive for a while. But once you're like one week of like broccoli instead of French fries, this is when the bacteria start dying. And then they dump all these chemical signals. Those chemical signals travel to your brain and they induce cravings. And then what happens is, since there's an emotional fluctuation throughout the week, right, they catch you on a weak point. Oh my God, I haven't eaten this for a week and I eat it. And oh my God, it tastes so good. And then that reinforces all of these craving signals in your brain. And they're like, oh my God, I've been craving for a week and this feels so good. And then your brain is like, yeah, let's do it again. Let's, this is, this is great. So the worst thing that you can do if you are dieting, is to crack within one week. The more that you crack within one week, the harder and harder and harder it will be to diet. There's even some really fascinating studies around something called the obesity set point. And this is what's really scary is if you're doing, this is why you should never do crash diets, 
So a lot of people will be like, oh my God, I have a wedding coming up. I'm going to do a crash diet. And I'm going to wait, lose some weight. Crash diets are bad for your long-term health. And here's the reason why. There's something called the obesity set point. So we have a weight set point. So our body has a weight that it likes to sit at. This is why most people don't fluctuate weight, right? You sort of have this like semi-normal weight. It may go up a couple pounds every few years, but generally speaking, you have like a weight that is set. And what our body does is it says, okay, this is our healthy weight. It's, let's say it's like 140 pounds, okay? So if we've got a weight of 140 pounds, our, if we eat more than that, like if we eat a ton of calories, our body will feel less hungry. And if we eat less than that, our body will feel more hungry. It tries to stay at 140 pounds. Now, what happens when you crash diet? When you crash diet, you induce a period of starvation. And then when the crash diet ends, you eat again. So now what is the lesson that you're teaching your body? You're teaching your body that there are periods of famine, right? There's a period of time where we're only going to get 1,200 calories instead of our usual 2,000. If you are a body and you are trying to survive periods of famine, what are you going to do? You're going to fatten up. After the famine disappears, our body is like, oh, crap, there was famine. So if we stay at 140 pounds, we will not be able to survive the next one. So we're going to increase our set point to 150 pounds. Therefore, we can survive the next famine. So now what happens is we feel hungrier. Our weight goes up to 150. And then what do we do? We're like, oh, shit. Now I weigh 150 pounds. Time to crash diet again. And so now you have to crash diet even harder because you need to lose 10 pounds. And then if you crack it all, you crash diet for a while, you drop back down to 135, you're like, whoo! And then you start eating again because the crash diet is over. And then our body is like, oh my God, this is a second period of famine. Last time we only lost five pounds, but this time we lost 15 pounds. It adjusts the set point higher. It makes you crave more because it's trying to keep you alive. It's like, bro, girl, there's famine. We need to fatten up to survive these winters. And the more you do it, the more it changes. Now, let me try to find a reference. Does that make sense? We don't understand this, right? So here we are trying to adopt a certain weight. Let me see if I can find this. Hmm. I have a paper here somewhere. I have a physical copy. Nope. Okay. Let me find it. Not giving up yet, chat. Is my gut bacteria related to why I binge a lot? Very possibly. Almost certainly. Oh. I think this is the journal. Okay. Um, I, I think this may be the original paper that I was talking about. So let's just take a quick look at this. Okay, so here we've got a paper on the role of set point theory. So this is, I think, like, uh, basically, like, there's a bunch of stuff that regulates food intake. And there's also, if we look at, um, what is it? Uh dieting and set point weight theory. Let's see if we can find something here. Um, yeah, I think this is older stuff. So I think these papers are like from the 90s. Um, and y'all should really look at look at this stuff. It's fascinating. Cookie settings. No. Nah. Let's see if we can find this article. Nah, I don't know. So y'all should really... Oh, let's do Wikipedia. There we go. Well, so like there, there's a lot of good stuff here about set point theory. It's really fascinating. But the key thing to understand about set point theory is that our body is just trying to survive and it doesn't understand, right? So you have to think about what you create in your body and what the body thinks is going on. And so when we go on a diet, our body thinks that there's famine. It doesn't understand. And this is why a lot of healthy dieting, if you want to, it's not dieting. So this is the other problem is I think, I think dieting is stupid. Dieting is one of the worst things that you can do because dieting is like, oh, I'm on a diet right now. 
which means that at some point you're going to stop and you're going to start all this. You're going to confuse your body, right? So if you diet for a while, I'm dieting. I'm cutting out this kind of thing for now because I want to achieve this kind of weight loss. When you do this sort of thing, you confuse your body because your body's like, oh shit, there's a famine. And so when you start eating again, your body's like, oh my God, we've lost weight because there's a famine. Then when we start eating again, we, we need to gain it back. We got to get past this period of famine, right? It's kind of crazy. So you lose five pounds and your body's like, oh shit, there's no food. And then when you get food again, it's like, we better move up 15 pounds so that we can account for the next famine. So the more that you diet, the more yo-yoing you're, you're going to get, which is why dieting is so hard and which is also why there is a dieting industry. See, the only reason you can have an industry is if the solutions don't work. Y'all get that? So if the, if the problem is solved, right, there's not like an antibiotic industry. Antibiotics work. We prescribe them when you need them, and then the problem is fixed, right? Antibiotics are, are a terrible investment for drug companies because you don't have lifelong patients because they fix the problem. But the dieting industry works really well because their fundamental mechanisms do not harness biology, they go against biology. So you induce some kind of weight loss, people feel good about themselves, they think that there's a win, and then they end up rebounding. This is why dieting is stupid. What is good is eating healthy. This is not a temporary change, this is a permanent change. A permanent change to the way that you eat. Now, it doesn't have to be on a daily basis, but doing simple things like, okay, I'm going to cut out 90% of my soda for carbonated water. This is, this is one of the things that I did many, many years ago, which I think is probably good for me, right? Or even simple water. So cutting out a particular beverage, reducing your alcohol consumption. I'm not saying don't ever drink again. What I'm saying is stop having a beer with things or even stop having soda with your food. These are permanent changes that we're going to make. And the way to eat healthy is to decide, okay, these are things that I'm comfortable with this change. This is not something that requires willpower. So if it requires willpower, that means that as my willpower fluctuates and as my life becomes stressful, I have less of it, which means that things are going to fall apart at some point. This is what the dieting industry relies on. You got to work really hard. You got to have a ton of willpower. And then one day your willpower is going to fail. You're going to rebound. But then what's going to happen when you rebound? You lost the weight with us once, so you're going to come back. This is also the business model of a lot of drug rehabs, by the way. Is, yeah, you felt so good and sober when you were with us, and then we're going to send you back home. And by the way, when you're here for 30 days and you're out on the beach and doing yoga and getting massages and all this kind of crap, then what happens? We send you back, and then there's alcohol there. And who knew after a few weeks you relapsed, or a few months you relapsed. And then you have such a positive association with the rehab facility that you go back. So some rehabs out there are actually based on repeat customers because their interventions don't work or they work for some amount of time. Dieting's the same way. So what you want to do is make changes that you can live with. This is the key thing. So I'll give you all a very simple example. I used to love and I still love grilled cheese sandwiches. And grilled cheese sandwiches are delicious. Get that butter on there, right? Put that bread on there. Put that cheese on there. Put another piece of bread on top. Pick that up. Butter the pan again before you flip it. You get that nice, crisp, golden, like, crispiness. You know, the crispiness on the outside, the softness of the bread, and the melted cheese in the middle. So I was trying to figure out how can I eat healthier. So what I started doing, very simple, very simple thing. If you guys want to know how to eat a healthy version of a grilled cheese. So you take a slice of bread, put butter, because we're not giving up butter. Screw this like olive oil camp. No, no, no. We're going to use butter, right? Nice, good butter. Put a slice of bread on there, put cheese on top. And then don't put the second slice of bread on top. No butter, no second slice. Then what you do is you flip that shit over. And you may think, oh my God, Dr. K, you mean put cheese directly on the pan? You're damn right. I'm putting cheese directly on the pan. The cheese becomes delicious. It gets like crispy. You get a nice monster or cheddar. And doesn't it melt all over the place? No, it actually like, so it'll start to melt and then it'll crisp up and it'll hold. And now you basically have an open face sandwich. And since you're actually, I don't know if it's the Maillard reaction or whatever. I don't know if that happens with cheese, but something happens with cooked cheese. Cooked cheese is amazing. 
And then what's happened is I haven't sacrificed butter, I haven't sacrificed cheese, and I haven't sacrificed bread. I've just changed it a little bit. And even then, the cheese is actually tastier when you when you grill it directly. And then what I tend to do is I put some stuff on top. So I'll add a little bit of like spinach or arugula, maybe some tomato, some hot sauce. You can sauce that stuff up. And now I have this other version of a grilled cheese. This is what I eat now instead of grilled cheese. And it tastes just as good. It's like it's not unsatisfying at all. And so th this is this is the way that we should be dieting, right? It's not dieting. It's not like a temporary thing that you do. It's alter your diet. Grilled cheese sandwich with crispy cheese on both sides. It's just on one side. But yeah, it's like it's not even a sandwich anymore. It's like an open-faced sandwich, which I think is not a sandwich. It's a slice of bread with shit on top. Yeah, so in Europe, grilled cheese means actual cheese grilled, not a, not a sandwich. Yeah, so I think like if you look at some of these cultures that have things like halloumi, right? Oh my God, halloumi is delicious. Some vegetables actually make it better. I completely agree. So here's the other thing I like about my version of grilled cheese. So when I normally eat a regular grilled cheese that has two slices of bread, cheese in the middle, and butter on both sides, one is never enough. Okay? I can, I can stomach two, but I feel awful at the end of it. Like, if you eat two grilled cheese sandwiches, it's too much. One is clearly not enough, and half a grilled cheese sandwich, like one and a half is like a little bit depressing. You know what I mean? It's like a little bit depressing. Like, you can't just do like, it's like you want a little bit more than half, but a whole one is too much. The beautiful thing about these sandwiches is when I eat two of them, because I have two, I feel full at the end, but it's not heavy, because half of it is like spinach and tomatoes with like hot sauce, raw onions, I actually really like on there too, right? And it's a tartine, yeah. So like, here's the thing, when, 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 I, when I think about eating healthy, you guys wanna know what the healthy gamer diet is. The healthy gamer diet is not eating healthy, it's eating healthier. It's like, let's just, let's just remove one slice of bread and a little bit of butter. And you can eat two of them. And then that's really all we need to do. So it's it's all about making sustainable changes. Changes that you don't have to work really hard to do. Get what I'm saying? Cooking some... Yeah, we, we actually owe y'all a Thandor stream from like two years ago. Which we're working on. The Thandor is 800 pounds, for those of y'all that don't know. And I just got it delivered... So we're, I'll, we'll work on it. Yeah, so when people are saying Europeans are thinner, I think there's more to it than that. I think in, in, I mean, they have trains and they walk too. So we here in the United States drive and have parking lots. Does drinking smoothies filled with fr frozen fruits and veg have the same nutritional benefits as eating them? Almost certainly not. Doesn't mean that it isn't healthy to do, but almost certainly not. So as Dr. Uma said, if you actually want optimal absorption, uh, what was it, of tryptophan, you need to eat it with complex carbohydrates. So this is where there's a lot of interesting science about absorption. And so there are some things that, for example, like eating fruits and dairy together, according to Ayurveda, is actually suboptimal absorption. And if you guys really want to understand this, there's a very simple scientific principle. So when I eat different kinds of macronutrients, okay? So if I eat something like a carbohydrate, a fat, and a protein all at the same time, this may taste really good, but what's going on in my stomach? So what goes on in my stomach is I have different enzymes that digest each thing. So for a carbohydrate, let's say I'm using amylase, which breaks down carbs. For a fat, I'm using a lipase. And for a protein, I'm using a protease, but oftentimes it's just you know the acidic environment. Protease, uh, protein digestion is a little bit different. But if we're simplifying it, let's say we have amylase, lipase, and protease. Now, let's say I'm eating a carbohydrate, a fat, and a protein all together. So what happens is I have three molecules of food and I have three molecules of enzyme. They all get dumped into my stomach and my stomach churns. So if you sort of think about it, 
what is the likelihood that the amylase bumps into the carbohydrate? It's one out of three, right? What's the likelihood that a lipase bumps into one of the other three? It's one out of three. So what that means is that my digestion, a lot of enzymes are bumping into stuff that they can't digest. So if you sort of think about what's the opposite scenario, let's say that I just have carbohydrate that I'm eating by itself and only amylase. Then my digestion is 100% sufficient. I mean, uh, efficient. Now, people may say, but people eat this all the time and digestion is fine. Yeah, because our body's really good. But if you guys want, there's a very simple experiment that you can do to experience optimal digestion. And that is eat some kind of carbohydrate by itself with nothing. So if you take a slice of bread and you just eat the slice of bread, what you will notice, chew like for 30 seconds, what you will notice is the change of the bread, uh, the taste of the bread changes over the course of the 30 seconds. So if I have a slice of bread, it's going to taste like regular bread. But by the end of the 30 seconds, I will taste sugar. I will taste sweetness by the end of the 30 seconds. And that's because the amylase is operating very efficiently. Now, you take that same slice of bread and you add a piece of cheese to it. Okay? So bite number one is just bread. Bite number two is bread and cheese. Or you add ham to it or whatever you want. You add hummus to it. Add something. And then what you will notice is that after 30 seconds, you, the bread does not taste the same. Very simple. The amylase meets 100% of the bread. It will digest it. When it eats 50% of the, meets 50 of the cheese, it will, it will not work in the same way. Very, very, very simple test that you can do. So these very simple principles of digestion we've lost sight of. And we come up with things like smoothies, which are combining all kinds of ingredients which are not normally designed to be eaten together, right? So let's think about it from an evolutionary perspective. We as humans are hunter-gatherers, and maybe we have some livestock. So I've got a cow at home, maybe, right? We're not actually even supposed to have dairy evolutionarily. But generally speaking, when we're a hunter-gatherer society, sometimes we'll have meals, but we don't oftentimes mix foods. It's like, I'm going out and I find a blueberry patch. I'm going to just eat a bunch of blueberries. Later, I'll go out hunting and I find something. I, I hunt some or I go fishing and I get a fish and I just eat the fish. So we actually don't combine foods. That's how our digestion is, where it's not designed to eat multiple things at the same time. Yes, so, uh, uh, salivary enzymes have amylase. Yes, that's what I'm saying is there's amylase in, in your mouth. That's why I'm using the example of a carbohydrate. It doesn't work with a protein because protease is in here. It's in your gut. So let's talk about ideal versus not ideal. So why are smoothies healthy for you even though they are not ideal? So if the problem in my diet is that I'm deficient with something. I'm not getting enough fiber. The value of adding a cup of spinach to my smoothie, even if it leads to suboptimal digestion, is worth it. So even though my uh, digestion is suboptimal, the fact that I'm getting one serving of fiber on balance improves my health overall. So the more you optimize, you don't need to optimize digestion until you're eating healthy. If you're eating unhealthy, Forget about optimizing your digestion. Just get your basic macronutrients in. So the other way to kind of think about it is, let's say I'm climbing MMR in a video game. And I can look at pro players who do all these different kinds of techniques. If I'm like iron tier or bronze tier or whatever, I don't need to be doing platinum level plays. I just need to be doing bronze level plays. That's all I need to do to climb. And the higher I climb, the more sophisticated I need to be. Diet is the same way. Right, so I play MOBAs, and so I like this game called Dota 2. And in Dota 2, like, I'm a shit-tier MMR. I don't need to be playing some, some pro-level play. I just need to do the basics right. And that's diet is the same way. So you guys don't need to worry about all this complicated— I mean, I think you all should learn this stuff because it's cool and hopefully stuff like that. But that's why it's, it's healthy to do unhealthy things, even. This is why we have, uh, uh, you know, dietary supplementation. People take supplements. There's a ton of evidence that show that supplements don't really work. <laughs> the supplement industry doesn't want you understanding that. Why? Because a supplement doesn't fix a problem. It's they're saying, hey, like you need to take this every single day, right? And there's some evidence that shows that supplements can be helpful. So there's, you know, isolated things like we know that, for example, omega-3, even things like some of these herbs like ashwagandha, St. John's wort, there's some data behind it. 
But this idea that you need to take a multivitamin every day is like not very good. Vitamin D supplementation, sure. So I'm not saying that the supplements are bad. There's absolutely good therapeutic uses or nutritional uses, health uses for supplements. But the main thing is that y'all don't need to be doing like 5,000 MMR players, or plays when y'all are at 1,000 MMR. Just focus on the basics. That's where you need to start. And this is also where like a lot of people don't understand this about meditation. So everyone, you know, there's two camps of people with meditation. There's all these weird like spiritual people who are like, oh my God, meditation can solve this and can do this and you will have an experience of universe and all these psychedelic experiences in meditation. And they say, here's the technique to have a psychedelic experience in meditation. You go and you do that technique and it doesn't work. Why? That's because you're not at that level. So the people who have these psychedelically induced experiences in meditation have very, very careful diets. So they have very, very low levels of inflammation in their body. They even will have, I suspect, sex hormone deficiencies, which is critical for progress in meditation. This is why everyone is celibate when they're monks. So they'll even eat certain diets that I suspect reduce your testosterone level. There's even an asana called Siddhasan, which is called Adept's Pose. It's the basic pose that if, you're, if you want to be a spiritual aspirant, you do this pose. And in Siddhasan, you place the heel of your left foot against your perineum, the area between your scrotum and your anus. And when you press that with your heel and you sit in this posture for eight or nine hours a day, what is in that place? Does anybody know? What flows through the perineum? The taint, as it were. So what flows through there is the blood vessels to your testes. You don't sit on the testicles. It's the area underneath the testicles. I would show you a picture, but then I'd get banned. Okay, so it's the area between your balls and your butthole, if you're a dude. And so when we press on that spot, that's where the blood vessels to our testicles are. So we slowly reduce the blood flow to our testicles. When you do that for a year or two years, I imagine that the tes testes start to atrophy. As the testes start to atrophy, your testosterone level goes down, your aggression level goes down, your horniness level goes down, all that kind of stuff. So I suspect that there's physiologic, I don't know if there's scientific studies, but you can just look at an anatomy text and you can kind of put two and two together. When I press on this part of my body, like what's going to happen? I'm going to compress whatever the fuck is there. Okay. And that's why Siddhasan is not taught to everybody. We've never taught y'all Siddhasan. Because when we use yoga and meditation, we're not trying to turn y'all. We're not trying to give induce some transient level, minor level of testicular, I mean, testosterone deficiency. That's not our goal, right? You guys want more testosterone. How do I be mentally? How do I be chat? So all of these things have subtle, subtle effects on the body. We just don't know it. But does low testosterone equal low sex drive? What a great question. We will talk about that next week when we are doing a deep dive into asexuality. But generally speaking, yes. But low sex drive can be caused by other things. This is the main thing that we don't understand. Or many people don't understand. Low sex drive has a differential diagnosis. It can be caused by all kinds of things, not just testosterone deficiency. So low levels of testosterone is one of the causes of low sex drive, but another cause of low sex drive is trauma. Another cause of low sex drive is insufficient sleep. Another cause of low sex drive is like not being happy in life. Low levels of mood or anxiety or high levels of cortisol. Stress. These are all causes of, of low sex drive. But what do we do in society? We think, oh my God, my, my sex drive is low. Let me boost my testosterone because that is something I can fix. I can take a pill or an injection. It'll fix my problem. So instead of addressing my, why my mood is low, why my anxiety is low, why all of these other things are wrong in my life, why I'm not sleeping well, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to take a testosterone pill. That'll artificially jack up my testosterone. Then I'll feel horny and I'll feel like a man. But then this is what's wrong with society. We look at this. So you guys have to understand this. Our society is getting sicker and sicker and sicker, despite the fact that we have more and more and more tools at our disposal. Neuroscience is at an all-time high. 
We understand so much about gut microbiome and we're doing fMRI studies and we know so much about all these different like chemical compounds and like herbs that will boost our testosterone level. We're taking all this crap. Why? Why do we need it in the first place? Because society is getting sicker. Why is society getting sicker? Because when we have a problem, instead of fixing the root, we take a supplement. So the more answers we have for our problems, the worse we're getting. Because now I'm going to fix this over here. I'm going to take an app over here. I'm going to do this over here. I'm going to do this over here. I'm going to do all these different things instead of fixing the fundamental, which is sleeping eight to nine hours a day. Just sleep. Most of your problems will get better. The one symptom that basically every mental illness, access one mental illness, shares is disturbed sleep. Anxiety, disturbed sleep. Depression, disturbed sleep. Schizophrenia, disturbed sleep. Panic attacks, disturbed sleep. PTSD, disturbed sleep. So if you sleep well, your mind has a chance to fix itself. Right? And so, but why don't we have, why don't we work on sleep, y'all? Because it's complicated. Because it's way harder than simply taking a pill. Right? Or sometimes, and this is why sleep medication works so well. Because, hey, someone invented a pill that helps you sleep. So we, ha we have these kinds of medications, right? These, um, these derivatives of benzodiazepines like Ambien. But what, you know, the really interesting thing is that it only increases sleep by about 15 to 30 minutes when you take it. It's all it does to your sleep. What it changes is our perception of sleep. This is another thing that a lot of people don't realize. When you say you sleep, you don't, I only slept four hours a night. That's almost certainly not true. So when you take a bunch of people, what we sort of discover is that if you measure your sleep in a sleep lab, you're sleeping like six to eight hours, even if you think you're sleeping two to four. But your perception of sleep is way off. The average human being has a huge sleep misperception problem. Because how do you know how many hours you slept? You're not aware when you're sleeping. So then you think to yourself, but I'm aware when I'm awake. But how does your mind calculate how long you've been awake? It is actually based on internal signals of fatigue. So you think you slept a certain amount based on how you feel when you wake up. So someone's asking about pads and stuff like that to help you lower your body temperature. I think actually that stuff is pretty good, right? So there's, so I think things like weighted blankets are actually like very good interventions. What's even better than a weighted blanket is to like cuddle with something, right? So part, part of, if we think about what is, why does a weighted blanket help us sleep? What's the mechanism of action of a weighted blanket? The mechanism of the action, uh, mechanism of action is that why does weight on top of us help us sleep? Because what is, what is the biology? What, what was the experience that we had as human beings, as we evolved that allowed us to sleep more comfortably when there's weight on top of us? Think about this for a second, right? What do y'all think it is? Where did our body learn that, oh, it's good to sleep now that there's weight on top of me? Right? And th that's the thing. It's like sleeping with other human beings or animals. And even if we look at the weight of a weighted blanket, so there are basically two or three weights of weighted blankets that work well. It's like 10 pounds. It's not 50 pounds. And what weighs about 10 pounds? When you have another human being sleeping next to you and they put their arm around you, the feeling that you feel of their arm and shoulder and stuff like that, I weigh about 130 pounds. This right here weighs 10 to 20 pounds. So it's the feeling of approximation of something like an arm or a leg. So weighted blankets are the biology that makes us, makes weighted blankets effective is essentially cuddling with other human beings or potentially animals. And this biology is not just human beings, it's also animals. It's like if you've got a cat, where does the cat like to sleep? I'm gonna come and sleep on top of you. So there are warmth signals, there are weight signals, and now what's happened in our society is that we don't like sleeping with each other. 
And as we've gotten worse at sleeping with each other, we've started to use weighted blankets. And now we have these like waifu pillows, right? That's another thing. Like the, so that the contour of that pillow and the shape approximates a human form. And we look at these people and we think, oh my God, this person is such a loser for using this kind of pillow. They're not a loser. We've just created a society where this person cannot get human contact. And we call them a loser for it. This person has no human contact. And there's also other stuff, which I'm kind of riffing here, but if you think about safety, right? And it, here's the thing, if you look at kids, unless you sleep train a kid, a kid is gonna wanna sleep with you until they're teenagers. That's what's biologically normal, right? So all the sleep training is like a movement away from our biology. Because what does safety feel like to a kid? A kid, even a one-year-old, feels safe when they're with their parents. That's hardwired. Even a four-year-old feels safe. And you'll notice this if you have children, that they get cuddlier the worse they feel. They need that physical contact. That's how they know that they're safe. And so when we have a society of people that is traumatized... They need human contact. And this is why people with a history of trauma end up in unhealthy sexual relationships because they don't know how to feel safe. They don't know how to engage with someone else. And I've seen this especially with my, my female patients where they'll end up having unhealthy sex. And why? Because that's the only way that they can get touch. And their body is hungry for something and they can't feel safe except when they're in the arms of someone else. When that happens as an adult, is that regression? So when we're hungry for another human being's touch when we're adult, it's not regression. It is actually stalling. So if you look at the science of trauma, we don't regress. I mean, sometimes it's regression, but generally speaking, it's not regression. It's that we get stuck at that phase because we never get it. So if you have some, if you're looking around at other people around you and you say to yourself, oh my God, my peers are capable of all of this. I am not. If you feel behind, the reason you're behind is not because you're regressing, it's because you stalled. And this is literally how our brain develops. So if we look at the science of cognitive development, we don't move on to the next stage until we fix stage number one. So if a child is neglected, and never touched or never held when they're growing up, they stall their cognitive development. You don't go to level three, four, five, six, and seven if you never beat level two. You stay stuck at level two. And this is why we get immature adults. We look at them, we're like, this person is so immature. Why are they immature? It's because they were never allowed to mature. Why are you mature? You didn't do anything for it. If you were loved as a child, if you felt safe as a child, you feel like the world is a good place. All right, so let's like dig into this for a second. Why is one human being confident? You look at all these other people who are like the same age as you and they're like they're confident and I'm not confident. Why is that? It's because when they were growing up, they were taught that the world is a safe place. That's where confidence comes from. The safer the world is, the more confident you can be. Why do I prance around naked in the confines of my own home? Because I feel safe. Why don't I prance around naked on the internet? Because I haven't started my OnlyFans yet. <laughs> right, you'll have to pay for it. So when a human being feels safe, they develop confidence. And when we live in a society or we, when we grow up in an environment where when bad things happen to us, if there is not a loving, caring figure to put the world back together, then the world becomes an unsafe place. So I'll give you all just a really simple example of this. So let's say I grow up in an environment where I get yelled at for crying. Very common. Shockingly common. Right? So your parent yells at you when you're crying. Now, this is very confusing for a child. Because normally, what is crying? What is crying? Crying is a signal for help. And a healthy child cries. Parent comes. Oh, are you okay, little baby? And then child stops crying. This is called secure attachment. So if you look at kids, if you want to see whether a kid is securely attached, see how long it takes for them to stop crying once someone shows up. 
and securely attached kids will take less than five seconds. They can be having a lot of crying eyes and buckets and buckets of tears, and then you pick them up and within five seconds, they stop crying. This is a secure attachment because they know, okay, now th the world was scary and now someone has shown up and now they feel safe. Now I feel safe. Okay, whoo! When the world is a dangerous place, I can do something to make it safe. I can cry. And when my crying works, okay, now I can affect change in the outside world. It is not something to be feared. This is where confidence comes from. Oh, you have a setback. No problem. I can do something to fix it. This is what confident people are like. These fuckers that are confident, they have a setback and they're like, no problem. I got this. And why aren't you like that? Because when you cried, you got yelled at. So let's understand how this affects you. I need help. Let me try to do something to improve my circumstances. And you get yelled at. Holy crap. I tried to do something to fix the problem and it made the problem worse. Now, if you grow up with a brain where when you try to fix something, it makes the problem worse. What do you think ends up happening? You stop trying to fix problems. Because when you try to fix it, it only makes it worse. Sound familiar? And now we wonder, why are we not motivated? Oh my God, I have so many problems in my life. I don't know. I don't know why I don't do something to fix them. And then you feel pathetic. The reason that you don't do anything to fix your problems is because early on, you learned that fixing your problems is a waste of effort. This is why people are not motivated. It's not your fault. You're a smart kid. You learned. It was a waste of time. Right? Because we're human. We're not dogs that bark at the moon. Because dogs in that way are not as intelligent as we are. So they continue to bark at the moon. Futility is no problem for a dog. But we as humans will learn that when I try to do something, it's not worth it. And then we lose all of our motivation. That is not a deficiency. You're not broken. It's an adaptation. This is why it's so hard. It's not something wrong. It's something right. It's the way that you're wired. Yeah, you can feel your back starving with touch. This is all like, this is the problem that we face today, right? So as our, hu as our society requires less interaction with humans, we become touch starved. And we get surprised. Well, oh my God, everyone is touch starved. Why? Because we don't need other people anymore. Except this is the one thing that we need other people for. Right? So I can get sexually aroused through something like pornography. There are assistive devices for orgasm. But there's no substitute for human touch that we've discovered yet. Having a pet comes close. Right? So you can... There's good outcomes in terms of mortality and cardiovascular disease and things like that for having a pet. Can we cultivate that safety on our own? It's really hard. It's possible, but it's very hard. Right? So that's kind of like, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can do on your own, but we as human beings were not designed as solo creatures. So the way that we get shaped is through interactions. So the body pillow is not an effective substitute. I would say it is a partial substitute. So this is what started to happen is we've started to try to figure out how to trick our brains into being satisfied. Right? Instead of achievement in the outside world, I'm going to get achievement in a video game, and that scratches the itch 50%. Instead of being proud of who I am in the real world, I'm going to be proud of who I am in the video game. That On social media, that scratches the itch 50%. And we've worked with hundreds, literally 500 content creators at this point. And what we find is that the identity that they develop from content creation is like a shadow of a real identity. Because they cre construct this persona. And so we, we're, we're going about trying to fill our needs without doing the thing that fills them. We try to find some kind of substitute that is easier because the actual way to fill our needs is hard or even impossible. 
Do you know why touch starvation is going to be the biggest source of product development in the history of humanity? Touch starvation is the biggest op capitalistic opportunity on the planet. People who fix touch starvation will be rich beyond belief. And the reason is because touch starvation is the one product that you can fill that requires another human being to actually fix. It's the one thing you can sell to someone else that unless they buy your thing, they have to rely on the kindness of another human being. So all of these attempts to self-help touch starvation when fundamentally it's never going to be solved. You're going to create the best customer base on the planet. So get into the, the touch starvation market early. I mean, I think we're already late. I saw something about Elon Musk making AI robots. I don't know if that's real or not. Right? But like... So I don't know. I, I don't know what to make of this stuff. I, I don't know how much of this is like an unfair shake that Elon is getting or what's going on. But, I mean, I think there's a reason why this is happening. And it's not just this, right? Like, everyone's building robots and AIs. And we want to substitute for humans. And the more we substitute for humans, those things will sell because we're getting lonely. But we're not fixing the problem. We're trying to create a solution to the, the fundamental problem of touch starvation is for people to touch each other. With consent. Don't go out there and be like. Right. It, it, it's it's like, I mean, this is, it's not a hard problem to solve. It's an impossible. <laughs> I mean, in a sense, it's very simple, but it's not easy. That's what I should say. Because touch starvation is not a problem you can fix for yourself, but it's something that you can fix for someone else. And the biggest problem in our society today is that we've started to assume that if I have a problem, I have to fix it. Because I can't rely on other people. Whew, very dangerous. Right? But life is a multiplayer game. It's not a single player game. So Rambro is asking tutorial on how to find one. Once again, there you are trying to fix the problem for yourself. So I would say that's the wrong tutorial. Not wrong. I'll work on it, okay? My promise to you, Rambro. I'll work on it, see if I can come up with something. But here's what I will say to y'all. Is that you're saying how tutorial on how to find someone. I don't know exactly what you mean by that. But what I will say is instead think about how you can be that person for someone else. That's what the fundamental shift we need in our society. See, we're all always looking to find our own needs met. Everything about our di a direction of our society comes from an over-reliance on independence. I'm not saying independence is bad. It's great in many ways. It's improved the world in many ways. But if we want to fix a lot of our, the problems that exist in the world, it's what can you do for someone else, not what can you do for me. And start to think about who in your life you can enrich their lives in some way. And that's what you should do. And if every person on the planet does that, 90% of the world's problems will be solved. Done. All we have to do is start thinking about other people. So Black Vulcan X is saying, I can't be that kind of person. Fair enough. So here's the crazy thing. It's not your responsibility to be that kind of person. It is our responsibility to fix that for you. It is our responsibility to, even if you cannot give anything to us, for us to give you something without expectation of return. For you to say, okay, so be it. You can't do it. I'm going to offer a hug anyway. That's what needs to happen. Right, because how do you get to be that person? How do you where where how does a human being lo learn kindness? They learn it from what they receive. I'm relying on others now. We we've all been relying on others from the very beginning. The only mistake that we've made is we've deluded ourselves into thinking that we don't need to rely on others.
Will regular masses save the day? No, Half Moonia, regular masses will not, but you will. You'll save the day. We don't need regular masses. All we need is you. We don't need we don't need everyone to save the day. We just need you. You'll be enough. You can change the world. And the, the big scam is that we delude ourselves into thinking that, oh, what I can do is not enough. I can't save the world. And thereby you deprive yourself of agency and you don't even try because it's not going to be enough. See, the biggest trick the mind ever plays is convincing you that it won't be enough. The most dangerous thought in the mind is it's not enough. So if you really stop and think about it, it's not enough is a mask that your mind wears when it doesn't want to do something. When it thinks that something is going to hurt you, it tells you it's not enough. You have to, it's very subtle. So anytime your mind tells you it won't be good enough, what is your mind actually trying to do? It's trying to protect you from pain. Oh, I shouldn't study for this test. Why? Because it won't be enough. You won't get an A. And then you may ask yourself, but wait, what is it trying to protect me from? It's trying to protect me from a B because I want an A. I need an A. But if I get a B or if I get a C or if I get an F and I tried, I'm going to be so devastated. So your mind tells you it won't be enough. It won't be enough is a trick that the mind plays to reduce your desire to act. Really interesting. So if you really want to fix your life, the most important thing to do is to do things that are not enough. There's not been a single person that I have ever worked with. And I've worked with hundreds of people at this point. I was about to say thousands, but let's just say hundreds and play it safe. Every single one that I have taught to do things that are not enough has substantially improved their life. If you can start doing the insufficient, your life will change. Oh my God, exercising for 20 minutes is not going to be enough. So I might as well not do it. You're right. If you want to get whatever the fuck your goal is, you need to exercise for 90 minutes, but do the thing that is not enough. See, that's the problem is we all look for the thing that'll work. We need to start doing the things that won't be enough, that won't work. Because the real success comes not from the thing that working or not working. The real success comes from the doing. Because this is the crazy thing. The only thing you can control is the doing. Right? I can spend, I can work really hard, get a ton of money and buy a house. And a hurricane could hit it tomorrow and dis make the house disappear. I can't control that. If I get paralyzed and I think to myself, oh my God, how am I going to protect my house from a hurricane? And then I wait to buy a house until I know I, it has hurricane shielding. Then I'm going to go my whole life without ever buying a house. Even if I can afford one and I can enjoy one and I can live one. Off to brush your teeth. There you go. Honestly, Joe Nicole, do things that don't work. That's the story of my life. When I started get, living it properly, right? Even this, this is, a, this is an exercise in futility. Oh my God, there's actually, so the CDC this past week released some kind of bulletin that there's a teenage suicide crisis in the United States. Crazy. What can I do? I can't fix a teenage suicide crisis. So I'm going to show up. I'm going to, we're going to talk a little bit about the, how artificial sweeteners actually help you gain, uh, cause you to gain weight. It's not enough to solve this problem, but we're gonna, we're gonna, it's an exercise in futility. We're gonna start living lives of futility. I strongly encourage you to live a life of futility instead of a life of inaction. Okay. <laughs> So, I think we're at time for today. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, on Monday, we're doing a stream with Dan Clancy. That'll probably be over on Twitch.
because he's CEO of Twitch. On Friday, we're doing a deep dive into asexuality. So yeah, that'll be fun. So we're going to do like a two hour like deep dive into asexuality. So it'll probably be about a 90 minute lecture followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. So we're going to understand asexuality. Where does it come from? What's the differential diagnosis for it? So if you feel like you're asexual, does that mean that you are asexual? Or what are the different reasons for it? I think one of the biggest tragedies around asexuality, which on the one hand, I'm really grateful that we're becoming more accepting of people and whatever their sexual preference is. On the flip side, I think it's a little bit unfortunate because some people that I've worked with who believe they are asexual have some problem that is blocking their sexual feelings. And then they're usually happier if they can overcome that. So we're going to learn a little bit about how, on the one hand, it probably is just a normal variant of human biology or psychology. And then on the other hand, there are some things that can contribute to it, like hormone deficiencies and stuff like that. And so as we kind of get into a deep dive around what are all the, how does asexuality work? Where does sexual feeling come from within the body, the brain, the mind? We'll also discover a couple of really interesting things like the overlap between neurodivergence and asexuality, which is somewhere between two and five times as likely if you're on the autism spectrum. And what is even the mechanism for that? So even if you're on the autism spectrum and you're interested in becoming less asexual, what does the science tell us about potential avenues to do that if that's a goal that you've got? So hopefully that'll help. And... Uh, yeah, so Violet Emerald is saying, I'm an asexuality activist and community organizer. So glad you'll be talking about it in a real way. Violet Emerald, I rely on you to tell me if we make a mistake, right? So I'm going to do my best to be as open and accepting and scientific as possible. And we're relying on y'all in the community to let us know what we did well and what we did poorly. Okay. Take care, y'all. We will see y'all on Monday. Have a good weekend. Oh, yeah. Hypersexuality or sex addict? Absolutely. We'll do it. Let's start with asexuality. Okay. And then maybe we'll do something. Yeah, we'll do something on hypersexuality. Well, well yeah, sure. We can do a deep dive on why people have sex. What's the deal with sex? What's it all about? <laughs>